powered flight was just 11 years old when the First World War began. But a dedicated group of men transformed the aeroplane into one of the most important weapons in helping to win that war. Some of the pilots who flew these incredible machines are remembered as glamorous heroes. Germany's highest scoring ace was the aristocratic Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. In contrast, the top British aces were two little-known working-class heroes, Edward Manick and James McCudden. On two occasions, he shot down four aircraft in a day. On two more occasions, he shot down three on a day. They were called Knights of the Sky, but beyond the myth lay a brutal reality. There was no romance about this. The best way to kill someone is a bullet through the back of the head before they even knew you were coming. As the number of their victories grew relentlessly, the Aces' reputations soared, but so did their chances of dying in flames. He feared it to the extent that he started taking a revolver up with him, the idea being that if fire broke out, he would take the revolver and blow his own head off. Time Watch tells the story of two unlikely heroes and their battle against the odds, and themselves, to survive. And of a 90-year-old mystery surrounding the death of one of them. Just over 90 years ago, machines like this, constructed mainly from wood and fabric, were one of the most feared weapons of war. Today, only a handful of these historic aircraft are still capable of flying, the largest number of which form the Shuttleworth Collection, based at the old Warden Aerodrome in Bedfordshire. The collection provides a unique link with the earliest days of powered flight. This is a, a Bristol box kite from 1910. And it, it really is, it's, it's a true flying machine. It's, it's wonderfully basic. It's the kind of thing that, that our pilots who went out to France in, in 1914, this is what they would have learned on. And in fact, this is what they would have flown before the First World War. They'd have been very used to this kind of thing. And it's, it's beautiful, it's basic, it's got, look, it's got bicycle wheels. It's completely festooned with, with wires. And th this is the reason why they called it, these early machines flying bird cages. You can, you can see precisely why. And really, it's an astonishing thing. When you think about the, the, the sophisticated aircraft that were being produced in, in 1918, we're only talking a few years on from the manufacture of this sort of contraption. In 1914, just before the outbreak of war, this was Britain's entire air force, a disparate collection of only 33 aircraft. It was called the Royal Flying Corps. The aeroplanes at the time were looked after by a new breed of soldier, the air mechanic. Among them was 18-year-old James, or Jimmy, McCudden. During the course of the First World War, Jimmy McCudden would rise from humble origins to become one of the most distinguished and highly decorated fighter pilots of the war. Against military regulations, Jimmy McCudden kept a written account of his innermost thoughts and feelings. It's also a unique record of the history of aviation in World War I, and it's here at the RAF Museum in London, where McCudden's writings are kept. 
Well, this is the first of four books which form the manuscript for Jimmy McCudden's uh, book, Five Years in the Raw Flying Corps. And it's written in pencil. It's an army exercise book, as are the other three volumes. Ruled pages written in pencil by him in his own very neat handwriting. And he started writing one lovely morning about the end of April 1913. Found me very pleased with life in general. Jimmy McCudden came from a close working class army family. In the phrase of the day, he was born in barracks, one of six children of a non commissioned officer. Educated to the age of 14 in the army school, he became a bugler boy in the Royal Engineers, but soon followed his eldest brother Bill into the newly formed Royal Flying Corps. Bill was really in at the very beginning of aviation in this country, a real pioneer. He was only the fourth non-officer pilot to be trained as a, as a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps. Bill would frequently give his younger brother Jimmy unofficial flying lessons. It was his big brother. He was flying. He was doing what Jimmy wanted to do. So it's not surprising that it was the sort of motivation that would take him forward to fly himself. The archives of the Royal Air Force Museum in London also hold a number of other letters and papers from the McCudden family. Aviation historian Alexandra Churchill has uncovered one which predicted a glorious war for the young Jimmy. This is a, an extraordinary letter from James's older brother, Bill. Um, it's written the day before war is declared, and here on the back he's almost prophetic. He says, I can see Jim coming back with a VC or something of the sort. And here at the bottom as well he says, you can bet your boots that the McCudden Syndicate will not be missing when there is something doing. Bill's letter would prove accurate on both points. The following day, war was declared, and the McCudden Syndicate, Bill and Jimmy, were to be posted to France. But even before leaving England, Jimmy witnessed the very first fatal air crash of World War I, when his friend and fellow air mechanic Keith Barlow was killed in a flying accident. We then heard the engine stop, and following that, the awful crash which once heard is never forgotten. I ran for half a mile and found the machine in a small copse of firs. So I got over the fence and pulled the wreckage away from the occupants, finding them both dead. I shall never forget that morning at about half past six, kneeling by poor Keith Barlow and looking up at the rising sun, then again at poor Barlow, who was killed purely by concussion and wondering if war was going to be like this always. Flying these early aircraft was a shockingly dangerous profession. Of the 14,000 British pilots killed in World War I, over 8,000 died while training. And yet Jimmy McCudden was not put off by his early experience of death. By mid-1915, he had been promoted to a sergeant and an observer, one step closer to his dream of becoming a pilot. Jimmy would have flown as an observer in aircraft like these. Flimsy two-seater machines not built for fighting. In fact, in the early days of the war, they were completely unarmed. The role of aviation at the start of World War I was seen both by the Army and the Navy as being one essentially of reconnaissance. Using ordinary plate glass cameras, the observers leaned out over the side of the aircraft to take photographs of the battlefield below. They are there for observation. They are there to locate the enemy, to pinpoint them, and then the second part of their job is that they will direct artillery fire to destroy that target. They also carried small bombs in the cockpit and dropped them over the side onto the enemy below. These were the first crude developments of the aircraft as a fighting machine. The problem was, of course, the other side was doing exactly the same thing. And before very long, uh, the crews of opposing aircraft uh, started taking along rifles, pistols, having a crack at each other. No army in the world could allow the artillery observation aircraft of their enemies to, to cross over the lines and photograph them, to, to, to bring down artillery fire right into the very midst of their trenches. They just couldn't let it happen, so they had to stop it. 
It rapidly became apparent that the aircraft needed more than just pistols and rifles to fight this new kind of war in the air. Guy Black restores vintage aircraft. He also has an extensive collection of aerial weaponry from the First World War. Yeah. Looks just like the picture. The easiest solution was to adapt a weapon that was already in use. The Lewis machine gun was standard issue for ground troops in World War I. It just needed a few alterations by the Royal Flying Corps. In order to convert it for aerial use, they removed the wooden stock off the back, replaced it with a spade grip that reduces the length significantly. Initially, they started off with a 47 round uh, standard infantry magazine, but that only gave you 10 seconds of use. So that was very soon doubled up to 97 rounds, and that's 20 seconds. Doesn't sound very much, but you would only fire it in one or two second bursts, well-aimed bursts, and the, the notion of hosing around the sky with a machine gun is absolute nonsense. It wasn't used in that way at all. Here is one fully loaded, and, you know, this length I can barely lift it, and to change one in the heat of battle is really quite a task. Like all observers, the young Jimmy McCutton was responsible for operating the machine gun. But it was difficult for the observer to fire at the enemy aircraft without running the risk of hitting his own plane. The easiest way to mount a machine gun is to mount it pointing forwards, because then you can actually aim the machine gun simply by aiming the aircraft. But on the majority of planes, where the engine was at the front and the propeller was at the front, you simply couldn't do that because the machine gun would shoot off the propeller. But it was the Germans who first adopted an ingenious device which synchronized the machine guns so they could fire between the blades of the propeller while it rotated. It absolutely revolutionized air fighting and it turned the aeroplane into a genuine fighting machine. Not just a machine that could defend itself if it had to, but a machine that could actually go out and attack. The Germans were quick to capitalize upon their technological lead, tearing into the Allied observation aircraft. The German pilots would become aerial warriors. The first of note in 1915 was Max Immelmann, who developed the tactics which gave them the upper hand in dogfights. They dive out of the clouds, they come out of the sun, they always tried to surprise you. There was no romance about this. The best way to kill someone is a bullet through the back of the head before they even knew you were coming. It was in this mayhem that the young observer, Jimmy McCutton, started to make a name for himself, successfully defending his aircraft from an attack by the German ace, Immelmann, who already had many kills to his name. Jimmy was credited with actually holding him off by accurate fire from his, from his Lewis machine gun fired from the shoulder. He, it's not suggesting that he did any damage to him or shot him down, but actually just by, by holding him off and keeping him out of range. <laughs> I stood up with my Lewis gun to the shoulder and fired as he passed over our right wing. He carried on flying in the opposite direction. After this, he climbed to about 300 feet above us and then put his nose down to fire. Having been waiting for him, I opened fire at once and he promptly withdrew to a distance of 500 yards. I was very thankful indeed to return from this outing. I'd imagine that once Immelman and his Fokker saw us, there was not much chance for us. However, we live and learn. For his bravery in battle, Jimmy McCudden received the first of many decorations when, on the 29th of January, 1916, he was awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French General Joffre. Two days later, the newly promoted flight sergeant, Jimmy McCudden, was sent back to England to fulfill his ambition and train as a pilot. But Jimmy's dream of flying alongside his elder brother Bill would never be realized. Bill had been killed in a flying accident while training a new pilot. 
He was the first of the McCudden family to lose their lives in the Royal Flying Corps. He wouldn't be the last. In his memoirs, Jimmy recorded his brother's death with the bland words, I suppose it had to be. In reality, it was a devastating emotional blow. He was called into the orderly room and given a telegram informing him of Bill's death and the people that were there said that he didn't appear to take it in. Um, he left with the telegram and he sort of stumbled out of the office and um, one of the NCO pilots found him just inconsolably sobbing his heart out in between two hangars. Whatever the emotional impact of his brother's death, it didn't slow Jimmy's rapid progress. He qualified as a pilot in April 1916, and within a few months was in France flying DH-2 single-seater fighters. He recorded his first kill at the beginning of September, and in October received the second of his gallantry awards, the Military Medal. McCudden was honing his skills, developing a meticulous attention to detail which would mark him out as an exceptional pilot. When he came around to early 1917, he'd by then got five victories uh, and he'd served overseas for several months and he was posted back to the UK uh, as, a, as, a, as a trainer. And he would travel around the country with, with other experienced um, pilots, lecturing to various courses, lecturing to various um, training schools on air combat tactics. It was here that the new pilots would come to grips with the techniques of aerial warfare. One of those Jimmy was to train was his younger brother Jack, the third of the McCudden brothers to join the Royal Flying Corps. But he was also to instruct an extraordinary character called Edward Manock who, like Jimmy, was to become one of Britain's highest scoring and most decorated fighter pilots of World War I. Manock and McCudden formed a close bond from the start, and Manock credited McCudden with saving his life during training. He had just had his first spin and remembered my advice, which I think at the time was to put all the controls central and offer up a very short and quick prayer. Manock was a, a typical example of the impetuous young Irishman, and I always thought was of the type to do or die. Born in Ireland, Edward Mick Manock, like Jimmy McCudden, came from a working class military family. But here the similarity ends. Manock's father abandoned the family, taking their meagre savings and leaving them in poverty. Manock left school at 14, he worked as a grocer's boy and then a variety of other jobs before joining the National Telephone Company, where he began to travel. At the outbreak of war, the 26-year-old Manak was in Istanbul, working as a telephone engineer. Turkey had sided with Germany and her allies, and Manak was interned, where he suffered deprivation and serious ill health. In 1915, he was released back to Britain on medical grounds. He's released primarily because the Turkish authorities assume that he won't be a combatant, that his health is too poor for him to recover and then to join the fight um, uh, uh, against uh, the Germans and their allies. In fact, Manock made a remarkable recovery and joined the Royal Army Medical Corps. But anxious to seek action, he transferred to the Royal Flying Corps, where he qualified as a pilot and was posted to France. At 29, Mick Manock was some 10 years older than the typical RFC pilots he was joining. He was also more worldly wise, which initially caused friction with his fellow officers. When he arrived there, um, he got off to a bad start. He makes the fatal error on the first night of sitting in the favourite chair of the pilot who had died that day. He was a man who certainly uh, wasn't the average airman of his time. He was a socialist. He was a supporter of Irish home rule. He came from a broken home. He, he was all these things that, on the face of it, you would think he wouldn't fit into the military. But the Royal Flying Corps was an organisation of slightly irreverent, questioning people who were trying a new activity, an activity that had never really been carried out before. 
and in a way it was ideal for somebody with Manic's uh, edgy character. If Manic appeared overly confident amongst his fellow officers, the writings in his personal diary reveal a much more fragile character. And what's interesting about his diary is how frank he is in terms of recording his emotions. And it's quite clear that um, uh, he is almost petrified by um, his initial experiences up in the air. Manak was very different from McCudden. There's no two ways about it. He was a nervy individual. Business out here is still very chock full of excitement. I have an idea that my nerves won't take very much of it. Old Mackenzie goes away on leave today. 14 days. He's in need of it. If ever a lad was cracked up, Mac is. I wonder if ever I shall get like that. And what my friends will think of me if I do. Old Paddy, the devil may care with nerves. I feel nervous about it already. Manak's fear was justified. The life expectancy of a new pilot in 1917 was just 11 days. The aircraft they were flying were flimsy and dangerous and lacked basic safety equipment. Even parachutes were deemed surplus to requirements. The view of the powers that be in the United Kingdom was that they did not want to give parachutes to their pilots because it was felt that with a parachute they might be encouraged not to make it all the way back with a damaged aircraft. Without a parachute, being trapped in a burning aircraft was a constant fear amongst British airmen and one that haunted Mick Manock in particular. He feared it to the extent that he started taking a revolver up with him when he flew. He had it in a small pocket uh, in the cockpit. The idea being that if fire broke out, he would take the revolver and blow his own head off. Manick's friend, Jimmy McCudden, had been promoted to captain and sent back to the front. In August 1917, he was posted as a flight commander of the RFC's Elite 56 Squadron. He would be flying the new SE-5A, unglamorously named, but one of the most successful fighter aircraft of World War I. It might be described as the spitfire of the First World War. It remained uh, a predominant fighter capable of dealing with any opposition right through to the end of the war. It was in the SE-5A that McCudden and Manock sealed their reputations as Britain's top fighter aces of the First World War. Wooden framed, fabric covered, able to survive being attacked by other aircraft. There's nothing much in here, so bullets would pass through. Jimmy McCudden himself talks about coming back from a, a dogfight. He was perfectly intact, the aircraft was flying, and he counted 120 bullet holes in the side of the aeroplane. Within three days of arriving back in France with his new squadron, Jimmy shot down a German aircraft. But he faced a challenge of a different nature from his fellow British officers. The entire squadron almost is comprised of ex-public school boys. Um, pretty much every major public school was represented. So understandably, there are going to be times when, as a man who left school at 14, having been educated in an army setting, McCudden was not going to comprehend entirely what was going on in terms of conversation. I always wished I'd had the advantages of a public school. After I joined the officers' mess, I often felt ill at ease when the chaps were talking about things I didn't understand. But Jimmy's modest education didn't prevent him performing exceptionally well as a pilot. He started slowish, but steadily, and gradually that built up. So over the next several months, he was shooting down regularly. Uh, on, on two occasions, he shot down four aircraft in a day. On two more occasions, he shot down three on a day. 
In just five months to December 1917, McCudden shot down a staggering 52 enemy aircraft, accounting for 40% of the entire squadron's total and making him Britain's top scoring pilot. Jimmy's tactics were one of patience, of stalking. There was absolutely no point, as far as he saw, in, in sort of pressing on gung-ho when your ammunition runs out, ram your aircraft into the opposition. Uh, what you, lo you lose your aircraft and maybe your life, they lose theirs one for one. Nobody's going to get an advantage. This is just not professional. But McCudden had another advantage. He was able to fly higher than his fellow pilots, and it was his training as a mechanic which gave him the edge. McCudden, using all his engineering experience, sort of supercharged his SE-5, his aircraft, so that it would go another three, 4,000 feet higher. And they would go up there f flying long patrols. It's amazing, really, at that height, 20, 21,000 feet, no oxygen, freezing cold. And he'd be up there waiting for them to come across. And he would just shoot them down. He'd shoot two, three, four down. It was fantastic. But there's a cost. There's always a cost. He was starting to suffer. Uh, you just can't fly up there at that height. You need oxygen. I felt very ill indeed. This was not due to the height or the rapidity of my descent, but was due to the intense cold that I experienced up high. So that when I got down to a lower altitude, I could breathe more oxygen with the result that my heart beat more strongly and was trying to force my sluggish and cold blood around my veins too quickly. My word, I did feel ill. And when I got on the ground, the blood's returning to my veins. I cannot describe as anything but agony. While McCudden fought to overcome the physical difficulties of flying at high altitude, his friend Mick Manick was winning his battles with his mental demons. And by the summer of 1917, Manak had received the Military Cross for bravery. He had also become an ace. French journalists, I think, uh, coined the phrase of the ace, uh, the top of the pack. An ace was a pilot who had shot down more than five enemy aircraft. But Manak's diary reveals that he was having difficulties facing up to the consequences of his actions. I had the good fortune to bring a Hun two-seater down in our lines the other day. Uh, luckily, my first few shots killed the pilot and wounded the observer, besides breaking his gun. The bus crashed south of Avion. I hurried out at the first opportunity. The machine was completely smashed. And, rather interestingly, also was the little black and tan terrier, dead, in the observer's seat. I felt exactly like a murderer. Despite his, at times, contradictory emotions, Manik was developing into a very effective fighter pilot. He's worked out the tactics. You know, he now knows uh, the most effective way of shooting down German aircraft, of uh, flying from behind, flying from the east, um, of flying out of the sun, and crucially, flying extremely close to your target before you unleash a stream of machine gun bullets. And it wasn't long before Manic's exploits were being recognized amongst his peers. Even the newspapers back home were writing about Mick Manic, although they had to refer to him as Captain X. The war ministry refused to allow the press to name Britain's star pilots preferring the view that it was the team effort which was important and not the individual. The authorities also became concerned that if a pilot had been raised to considerable public awareness um, as a very leading uh, exponent of his art and was then uh, killed in action, that this could be bad for public morale. Unlike the British, the German authorities positively encouraged public adulation of their aces, the most famous being Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, seen here with the British pilot he had just shot down. In Germany, the aces were household names. They were known to every man, woman and child in Germany. They publicised them throughout the newspapers. They were 
the supreme embodiment of, of German manhood. They stood for everything that was brave and good about sort of German men at battle. By January 1918, the British press had had enough. Hungry to personalize the exploits of our heroes, they began to put pressure on the war ministry to change its rules on publicity. And so the Daily Mail wrote an article. Uh, this article is entitled, Our Unknown Air Heroes, Germany's Better Way. So an inflammatory sort of headline in itself. And in the article, he actually says, what I want to know is why an Englishman whose hobby is bringing down Sky Huns in braces and trios between luncheon and tea, and who can already claim a bag of 30 enemy aircraft, should have to wait to be killed before a grateful nation waiting to acclaim him can even learn his name. That was on, on January the 3rd. Over the weekend, the uh, War Ministry had obviously considered their position. And so uh, by uh, Monday, January the 7th, 1918, the Daily Mail again uh, were actually uh, producing an article that says, Our Air Stars. And down here we have the story of Captain McCudden, MC, born in barracks, as the, as the heading says, uh, and describes his, his early life and his achievements in the Royal Flying Corps. Not only does it name him and tell, some, tell us something about him, but also on the back of the paper, um, the, there's a picture of him for the first time as well. So people can now know his name, but also they can see what he looks like. For Jimmy McCudden, the publicity was not welcome. This is a letter that Jim writes home to his sister Kitty on the day that his name becomes public in the Daily Mail. And he says to her, have you seen all of the bosh in the paper about me? And then he also says, on no account whatever any particulars or photos of me to be sent to the papers, as that sort of thing makes one very unpopular with one's comrades. McCudden's modesty was made all the more remarkable by the fact that when he left France for Britain in March 1918, Jimmy had recorded 57 victories making him the top-scoring British pilot. But the war was exacting a terrible toll on the McCudden family. Jimmy received news that his younger brother Jack, who he had helped train as a pilot, had been killed in action. The second of the so-called McCudden Syndicate to die. As he absorbed the impact of his brother's loss, McCudden was to receive more welcome news. For his conspicuous bravery, exceptional perseverance, and high devotion to duty, he was awarded Britain's highest decoration, the Victoria Cross. There's not a prouder man living than when on the 6th of April I went to Buckingham Palace. I shall ever remember how the King thanked me for what I had done. Jimmy McCudden's is one of only 19 VCs awarded to airmen in the First World War. Um, so, before we see the VC, if I could just let you put some gloves on. Indeed. Thank you. This is a... David Rowland has come to the Royal Engineers Museum in Chatham, McCudden's hometown, where his Victoria Cross is kept for safekeeping. This is the original wow. McCudden VC. There we go. Thank you. Wow. What a moment. I've read about this, heard so much about it in all the sort of work I've done and, and studying about McCudden, it's a real privilege to, to actually be able to handle it. Wonderful. And yes, there on the back, um, as, it, as it should be, his name, Lieutenant Temporary Captain J.B. McCudden, DSO, MC, MM, General List, and uh, I guess 56 Squadron RFC. It's a, a delight and a privilege. Do you know what happened when he received this? And the, the day, 6th of April, 1918, he went to the palace to receive the Victoria Cross, but not only did the king give him this, but also gave him two DSOs, a bar to his military cross, so he came away with an incredible display of medals in, in, in one presentation. Despite his excitement, McCudden was typically modest about his award, traveling to Buckingham Palace alone, not even telling his family the investiture was taking place. Meanwhile, the press continued to hound him. I see the papers are making a fuss again about the ordinary things one does. Why, that's our work. Why fuss about it? I'm so tired of this limelight business. If only one could be left alone a bit more and not so much the hero about it. However McCudden felt about the intrusion, 
It was inevitable that this glamorous young fighter pilot would become the center of attention while out enjoying London's clubs and theaters. London at the time is full of what I think have been termed Whitehall warriors, which is men in uniform who haven't seen any service. Um, and McCudden, of course, isn't one of those. And yes, he's got medal ribbons lovingly sewn on by his mother on his tunic. It wasn't just the club and theatre owners who were keen to have McCudden's company. Jimmy had always been a bit of a one for the girls. There is one girl, and that's Teddy O'Neill. She's a dancer in the West End, and as we know, McCudden is going to every show he possibly could on leave, and he had met her there. Uh, I think he was seeing somebody else at the time, because there's a bit of a crossover which causes him some problems, and um, he takes her up on a joyride. And he was brash enough to write in his logbook as well that he'd taken her up as a passenger. While on leave, Jimmy was to spend time with fellow pilot Mick Manick. They were two decorated war heroes, clearly enjoying themselves with the opposite sex. In Manick's diary, McCudden was to write the enigmatic comment, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, to which he added the word, Piffle. The frivolity was short-lived. By the spring of 1918, the war was reaching its savage climax, both on the ground and in the air. Aircraft were now being used to support the troops. The days of the lone aerial dogfights were over, but they were now even more vulnerable to attack from the ground. Things have changed. It's not aerial jousting. It's just another part of mechanized warfare. In 1918, what you see is the aces falling one by one. One by one, they just make that one mistake too many. And the first of those aces to be brought crashing to earth was the now infamous German pilot, Baron von Richthofen. The British authorities afforded Richthofen, who had 80 kills to his name, a lavish funeral. Six British airmen bore his coffin to the French cemetery at Bert Angles, where Allied newsreels recorded the event in all its pomp and ceremony. Not everyone mourned Richthofen's death. Mick Manick refused to raise his glass and salute the downed German ace. Manet wouldn't sign up to that, and uh, he's um, allegedly supposed to have said, I hope the bastard burnt the whole way down. And he had a, a deep, deep loathing of the Germans. Primarily, I think, it's because of his personal experience in the winter of 1914, 1915, the way he personally was treated by the Turks. He's not fighting Turks, so you know, he's fighting the people who are responsible for bringing Turkey into the war, Germany. Against the odds, Manak embarked upon an extraordinary run of victories. In May 1918 alone, he shot down 20 German aircraft, beginning to rival his friend McCudden, or Mac as he called him, as Britain's number one ace. My total is now 41. If I have a bit of luck, I might beat old Mac. Then I shall try and oust old Richthofen. It looked as though Manick might just do it, as McCutton had now spent three months away from the Western Front, teaching aerial fighting to new pilots in Britain. McCutton was desperate to get back to frontline duty in France. The authorities, however, were less keen for him to go. Bear in mind, now he's famous. Uh, the War Ministry, having decided that they're going to let people know who their heroes are, now actually want to use these heroes in a very constructive way to improve morale and, and the spirit back home. So the, I think there's a reasonable conclusion to draw that they would have been happy if he didn't go back out because they didn't want to lose him. He had every intention uh, of going back to France, uh, and he talked about the men he left out there, the young boys he called out there, still fighting and dying for their country, and he wanted to go back and join them. Eventually, the war ministry relented, and McCutton was offered command of the Elite 85 Squadron. But in an extraordinary move, the squadron rejected him. 
on the grounds that he was the son of a non-commissioned officer and had risen through the ranks without recourse to a public school education. Despite his VC and being the top scoring British ace, being born in barracks made him less worthy in some people's eyes. Eventually, he was given command of 60 squadron in France. On the day of his departure, he met with his sister Mary and handed her a package containing his VC and his other medals. It was the last time she was to see him. On the early afternoon of Tuesday the 9th of July, 1918, Jimmy McCutton picked up his brand new SE-5A from Hounslow Aerodrome in London and set off for France, where his new squadron was stationed. The flight across the channel was straightforward and there was nothing on the journey to suggest that the new aircraft was in any way defective. Aware of the ever-changing front lines in the fast-moving conflict, McCudden landed at a British airfield at auxy le chateau just north of Abbeville in northern France, to ask directions to his new aerodrome at Boffles, close by. Bonjour, Monsieur. Je m'appelle Mike. Mathieu de France. Ah, bon plaisir. Aviation historian and former pilot Mike O'Connor has studied eyewitness reports and can describe the sequence of events that unfolded that day. Les avions militaires ont. This field is owned by the family of Mathieu de France, and until now he was completely unaware that in the First World War it was an RAF aerodrome. It was in this field that McCudden touched down. Right, Mathieu, this is the only known photograph of oh, yeah. the airfield at Auxy le Chateau. Uh, we are here, nous sommes ici. The hangars uh, along that edge of the wood. And here's the lineup of uh, some of the aeroplanes just there. The cut landed, and um, the two duty NCOs came out and spoke to him, and they gave him directions to where he should be going, which was Boffles mm. or Boffler. McCudden taxied and took off again. As he banked steeply over the airfield. His engine was heard to misfire. Then it cut out altogether. The plane was seen to nosedive into the woods just beyond the airfield. The first person on the scene was uh, Corporal Howard, and the aircraft was wrecked, and McCudden was lying beside the aeroplane, uh, bleeding profusely from the nose and the mouth, and was unconscious. Um, a couple of other people then arrived, and he was put on a stretcher and removed to a casualty clearing station quite close by, where he's found to have suffered a severe fracture of the base of the skull and the jaw. Um, he didn't regain consciousness and died two hours later at 8 o'clock. No one will ever really know what happened that day, but it seems likely that mechanical failure caused the aircraft to lose power and crash. After surviving three years of aerial warfare, it was a tragic accident which claimed Jimmy McCutton's life. The following day, a few miles from the scene of the accident, McCutton was buried at the tiny military cemetery at Wavens. It seemed a terrible end for such a brilliant pilot and notable ace to die in a simple accident. This is the grave of uh, Jimmy McCudden. With all Victoria Cross holders, on the headstone is a facsimile of the, the, the decoration, as you can see here. Very distinctive, you see a Victoria Cross 
headstone from a long way away. And beneath it, most families had uh, an epitaph, an inscription. And I'm particularly fond of this one. Fly on, dear boy, from this dark world of strife onto the promised land to eternal life. I find it very emotive, very moving. The style of his funeral, however, seemed less heroic than the manner in which he had fought the war. There was a lot of criticism of the funeral. Um, two officers from uh, McCudden's former squadron, um, one said that it was a rather rushed affair, and another one, he said it made my blood boil, that the whole service was done in Latin, mumbled in Latin, and a very soulless affair. And in fact, um, he, he compared it very unfavorably with the funeral that had been accorded von Richthofen, the top German ace, only three months before. In just four years, James McCutton had risen from the position of air mechanic first class to major. He had won the Victoria Cross and was one of the highest scoring British pilots of World War I. And yet, at the time of his death, he was just 23 years old. Jimmy McCutton's death had hit his friend Mick Manock very hard, and he vowed to avenge him. By now, Manock had nearly equaled McCutton's victories, but his demons were taking an increasing grip on his state of mind. He was willing, but his mind was starting to let him down. And there's an awful tale of he was on leave, he was with one of his old friends, and, and the friend just watched aghast as, as something in the conversation triggered it off and Manock started to cry. And he didn't just cry, he was crying, his nose was running, snot running everywhere, he was snivelling. He still hasn't been able to come to term with um, his own uh, private fears, most notably the prospect of being shot down and burning to death. Publicly, however, Manock continued to be a hugely charismatic leader. And for bravery in the spring of 1918, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. Not once, but three times, in just over a month. He does have, amongst his peers, um, an awesome reputation. And yet, there is still this contradiction in that, privately, he's the tortured individual. Manock's mind was in a terrible state. If you read his letters, you can see it, it's jumping from subject to subject. You know, sh 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 will, will, will I live, will I die? Uh, should I get married? P -p -p you, you can feel him leapfrogging, jumping between subjects. He's a man who can't settle. Things are getting a bit intense just lately. And I don't quite know how long my nerves will hold out. I'm rather old now, as airmen go, for air fighting. Still, one hopes for the best. These times are so horrible that occasionally I feel that life's not worth hanging on to myself. But uh, hope springs eternal in the human breast. Manic appeared as if he had a death wish. He, he flew more and more missions, he took more and more risks. He would fly low, acting as a decoy. He started to break his own rules. He wanted to kill more Germans. He wanted to be out with his lads in the squadron. There's no two ways about that. I, I think it's just a very confused man struggling with almost impossible pressures that are bearing down on him. On the morning of the 26th of July, 1918, just three weeks after his friend Jimmy McCudden's tragic death, Mick Manock set off on patrol. With him was 24-year-old New Zealander Donald Inglis, an inexperienced pilot with no kills to his name. 
They were searching for a German observation plane which, for the previous few days, had been harassing British troops over the front lines near Mareville. Manock's plan was to give the rookie Inglis the opportunity of making his first kill. It was not long before he spotted the German plane. Within seconds, Manock got on the tail of the enemy aircraft. He fired a burst which killed the observer. He then moved aside to allow Inglis to finish off the attack. The German aircraft fell to the ground in flames. It was now that Manock was to inexplicably break his own golden rule by following the German down and observing the crash site. What he was doing was gobsmackingly stupid. It was a fatal error. German machine gun fire from the ground hit Manock's plane as it pulled away and his aircraft caught fire. With his plane in flames, Manock's nightmare had become realized. Eyewitnesses describe Manock's SE-5A as going into a glide before crashing beyond British lines. We don't know whether he was struggling with controls right to the last minute, whether he died quickly, whether he burnt to death. And it remains unknown whether, in the final moments, Manock was able to use the revolver he carried in the cockpit to end his life before the flames devoured him. Britain's two greatest First World War flying aces were to lose their lives within three weeks of each other. But Mick Manock's death brought with it a mystery that has endured for 90 years, the location of his final resting place. Writer and historian Andy Saunders has come to France to resolve the mystery. For the past 20 years, he has been trying to find out what happened to Mick Manock's body after his aircraft crashed in flames in the summer of 1918. His initial research leads Andy to the graves of the two German airmen who were Manock's final victims. This is the German war cemetery, which is about 12 miles away from where Mick Manock shot down his last aircraft. And in fact, uh, buried here is Lieutenant Ludwig Schopf and buried just a few graves away from him is Josef Hein, his pilot. And it's interesting, I suppose, that, uh, that here they are, both buried side by side, and yet Manock, the man who downed them, is still missing with no known grave. But there is some evidence which shows that immediately after the crash, Mick Manock's body was indeed found. And it is this evidence which brings Andy to a track called Butter Lane, close to where Manock's plane came down. After the war, the British authorities received information from Germany that the German army had found and identified Mick Manock and had buried him somewhere very close to this road. The Germans were very specific as to where on Butter Lane Mick Manock's body had been buried. 300 metres northwest of Pierre Aubert on the road to Pacau. But when the British authorities searched this location in 1921, they failed to locate Manock's grave. Because of the failure of the British to find Manock's body, his name is commemorated here at the Arras Memorial in France, along with 1,000 other missing airmen from the First World War. Andy is meeting military historian Paul Reed. They suspect that the German records were incorrect, which might explain why the British authorities couldn't find Manock's body 
Well, we've got uh, the trench map of, um, of the area we are now, around Butter Lane. So we've got the dotted blue line here. This is the German positions. This was their front line, Andy. And then beyond that, right over on the far side of the map, we can see the red line, yeah. um, and that is our front line. And we can see how close together they were. So this is La Pierre Aubert, marks on the, on the British trench map. Yeah. And it was from this position that the Wargraves Commission believed Manock to have been buried 300 metres northwest of. That puts it out here in, in no man's land. So really, that doesn't make any sense at all in terms no. of... No one's going to sacrifice your own men to bury one of the enemy's dead yeah, in exactly. the middle of a, of a battlefield where the yeah. war's still going on. It just doesn't make any sense at all. During his research, Andy came across one other intriguing piece of information. A letter from official files which describes the exhumation of an unknown British airman tantalisingly close to where the Germans said they had buried Manick. Using satellite navigation combined with World War I trench maps, Paul Reed is able to pinpoint the position where, in 1920, this unknown British airman's body was found and exhumed. And if we refer to uh, uh, the uh, GPS device, yep, we're right on the spot. Good Lord. So it was right here? It was right here. From this, it would appear that we're actually just behind the German trench there. It is, yeah, there's this sort of upside-down T-shaped trench uh, and the, the grave as you can see, Andy, is just behind that position. From the Germans' point of view, sure. away from enemy observation, they can bury uh, the man that they found in the wreckage of that aircraft. Yeah, exactly. Andy now believes that this is a much more likely place to bury Manic than in the middle of no man's land on an active battlefield. Despite the proximity of the two sites, the British authorities have always refused to accept that the body of the unknown airman was Manic simply because it was not where the Germans said they had buried him. Andy has come to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission Cemetery at Lavanti to visit the grave of that unknown airman. The grave that Andy believes should carry the name of Major Edward Manick. In my view, this has to be the grave of McManock. And I just think it would be appropriate if the authorities were to review the case thoroughly and look at all the evidence again. After all, this is the grave of one of the greatest heroes of World War I, and it would surely be appropriate recognition of him to have some finality to this and have a headstone here that actually bears his name. A year after his death, Mick Manock was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Manock and McCudden were two of Britain's greatest fighter aces from the First World War. Largely unknown today, they rose from modest backgrounds and for a brief period, they dominated the skies above the Western Front. Their skills and tactics helped turn a fledgling technology into a modern weapon which helped win the war. But it was a victory they would not live to see. The last of the great aerial warriors, they fell to earth just weeks before peace was declared.